And if you came in, you may have seen that we've got the communion back there and we're doing communion today. And we're going to tie it in with some of uh, really why I was thinking about it for today when we were doing the feeding of the 5,000. There was a reference scripture that we're going to look at that kind of just took me to that point. And we're going to talk about remembering today. Remembering. Uh, how many of you know if you remember something, it has an effect on today? How many of you don't remember something it has an effect on today? You know? Remembering is involved in what the effect is for today. God wants our remembering to have good effects. See, if something bad has happened, that's why he talks about forgiveness and dealing with bitter roots and all those things. Because in the remembering, he wants it to be a good thing. If, if there was something we had to go through that caused us to grow, he wants us to remember it in terms of that. Uh, God will tell them to remember that when you were going through the desert, I tested you. How about that? We're, we're to remember a testing. We also may remember that the enemy may have done something to us, but God can use that in the midst of it and turn it for something good. We're to remember that. God talks about remembering uh, uh, his people and, and his people remembering him. You know, when they went to Egypt and they were in the slavery, there was, came a point when they were at the bottom that they cried out to God, remembering something about who God was to Israel. And when God heard their prayers, God says this, I remembered my covenant with Abraham. So the, uh, uh, remembering has a lot to do with what is going on with the present. When you remember, you can pray. When God, when the praise happened, God remembers so that he does something in the present. Aren't you glad God remembers Jesus when you pray? And not you? I'm glad he remembers Jesus and not me. That's why when I come in prayer, it is in Jesus' name. I want you to remember Jesus, and in remembering Jesus, it has an effect on today. So our first statement is remembering has an effect on the present. Remembering has an effect or causes an effect to be right here on the present. Now, let's look at the scripture that, that I got this from, Matthew chapter 16. Here, Jesus had been talking to the Pharisees, and, and we're going to have, I think all the scriptures are in there. So uh, here, Jesus had been talking to the, the Pharisees, they did not agree with him. They did not believe in him. They were religious, but they did not have relationship. They did not know the living God. They knew rules and regulations and they put them on each other. And they called that somehow that that was righteousness. But when Jesus, the very son of God, the representation of God on the earth, they could not recognize it because they did not have relationship with God. And so Jesus is about ready to warn his own disciples, beware of that kind of teaching. Beware of that because if that leaven or if that thing gets into your, your dough, it'll take over the whole thing. He's, don't go for their teaching. Their teaching has poisoned them. Their teaching has made them hard as a rock, very hard to win a Pharisee to the Lord because they get so bound up in a misconception of who God is. So he tells them to, to beware of that. Look what it says. Now, when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. He had just been talking with them, so now he wants to teach them something. But they're not going to hear the words right because they're thinking about the bread. Look what it says. And they reason among themselves saying, it is because we have taken no bread. It's kind of like, why is he talking about bread? Why is he talking about leaven? Oh, guys, you know, we, we'd already talked about it. We didn't take enough bread. He's a little miffed at us. Jesus is kind of ri ribbing us that we have forgotten bread. Well, then Jesus finds out about it. It says, but Jesus being aware of it, that this is what they're talking about. He says to them, oh, you of little faith. Why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Now watch. The bread thing had, had happened in their presence. You know, it was the present moment. And they were presently talking about, hey, we didn't bring enough bread. And Jesus is trying to teach them something. And they're not hearing because they're dealing with something in the present. And then he says, oh, you of little faith. Why are you reasoning among yourselves about bread? Do you not yet understand or remember? You see that key word? Do you not remember the five loaves? that fed the 5,000, and how many baskets you took up? 
Do you not remember five loaves became 12 full overflowing baskets? Keep on going. Nor the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up there? Seven overflowing baskets. How is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? How is it that you're missing what I'm trying to say based on something in the present because you do not remember the past? Because if you remember the past, you wouldn't be worried that there is no provision. This is, you got to get this, guys. <coughs> Jesus is saying, if I've done it, that's who I am in the present. You do not, I see so many people, God will do something for them. Then when they need something the next time, it's like that God doesn't exist anymore. And they start all over again, like they're at ground zero. You know, like, like they have nothing. And he says to them, oh, you little faith, you've already forgotten. Don't you remember what I did? If you remember what I did, you wouldn't be concerned that I'm somehow fussing with you. We have a lack of bread. Wasn't I the one who taught you? Does not God not take care of the sparrows? If he feeds them, well, you are greater than the sparrows. And if you'll remember, you won't fall into missing what I'm trying to tell you today. Come on, church, are you getting this? If we will remember, it'll give us understanding to the present. That's our next one. If you remember, gives understanding to the present. By remembering... You can understand something that's going on now. If you forget, you may not interpret correctly what's going on now. If you don't remember the things that you should be remembering, then in the present, you'll miss what you should be getting, what you should be understanding. You got that? All right, let's go to the next one. This is in Joshua. Joshua chapter 4, and it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan. So this is when they came out of the wilderness into the promised land. Uh, uh, the Lord had instructed, tell the, the, the people carrying the Ark of the Covenant to carry that Ark into the river. And as they put their foot in, the, the water started pulling back. And the guys went down into the middle of the river and the waters parted on both sides and they were on dry ground. And they were instructed to stay there until all of Israel passed through on the dry ground. And when they got through on the dry ground, here's the instruction. It came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the middle or the mist, out of the very middle of the Jordan. Where? From the place where the priest's feet stood firm. So where the priest came down, the water separated, and that's where they stood. That's where you're supposed to gather the stones. What is it talking about? Connection to the event. Everything's about connection for remembrance purposes. See, if you have something that is not connected to the real event, it's a little hard to remember it correctly. But if you have something connected to the real event, that's a stronger memory for you. So he doesn't say, go get one down there where the water didn't part. He didn't say, pick one up on the shore. He says, pick up a memory thing from the very moment where it happened. See, God may never, ever split the Jordan again. May never, ever do it. He may do something in your life. He may never, ever repeat it but he surely wants you to remember it. Amen. See, if you got saved on, a, on your knees by your bedroom bed there, that's what happened for me. Guess what? I don't think anybody else is going to get saved on their knees in my old bedroom. But when I walk in, I know exactly what I'm looking at. Do you understand? See, I can't go to my father's house. I cannot walk upstairs and look in my old room without remembering the 13-year-old the, the boy that got on his knees. And in remembering, I'm stronger in the present. In remembering my past, then I know where God has brought me today. In knowing who I am, 
That's what it does for me. Do you understand? Now, nobody else may ever have that moment. It's not for them to remember. If dad ever repaints that room, takes up the carpet, does whatever, I, I'm, I'm going to lose a memory. <laughs> I'll be in the room, but all the items would be different. Guess what? All those items are still the same. How, how I as a teenager painted that room and where I was when I got saved, it's all still like that. It's a, it's a, it's a marker for me. It's a memory. And it's a positive thing, and it brings me to what I ought to remember and how great God was in that moment when nothing happened, no chills, no whatever, but he changed my life. Come on, do you understand? And so he says, grab a stone from the very place that it happened. Don't grab it down there. Don't grab it over here. Grab it where they were standing, and you know that's where the water split. You know that's where it dried up. Take, for your, take them and you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. All right, then go down to the 20th verse. And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. There he spoke to the children of Israel saying, when your children ask their fathers in time to come saying, what are these stones? Now watch. Joshua is telling the generation that was the young people who came out of Egypt. The young people who came out of Egypt watched their parents go through the Red Sea, and they were the young people going through the Red Sea. They were the young people. Remember when the people rebelled that only Joshua and Caleb of that older generation stayed? And when they crossed the Jordan, those that were kids up to 20 years old, those are the ones that survived. So now you have 60-year-olds and, and younger that are being told, take these stones. And now you tell that generation, you tell your children. So now these are the younger ones that are going through the Jordan and when your children ask their fathers, when your children ask you in times to come, saying, what are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before who? Before you. So the, the present generation is telling the younger generation or the next generation to come, remember, you guys were little, but... God did it for you. He dried it up for you. And look what it says. The waters before you until you crossed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over. So they're saying, this is your marker about your event. It's the same marker that I can now remember my event, which was he did the Red Sea. And in me remembering the Red Sea, that keeps me strong. You remember the Jordan will keep you strong. And it's the same God. The same God who split the Red Sea 40 years earlier is the same God who split the Jordan for you today. Now watch. It's what we say here a lot. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. When I hear somebody preach like somehow God changed... You understand that frustrates me because the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. And if he's the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament, he's the God of the now. Amen. When I hear people come and they've been taught or they believe somehow that, hey, you know, God doesn't do those things anymore. The miracles have passed. What the apostles did doesn't happen anymore. Now we got the word and we got this. That stuff doesn't happen anymore. And I'm like, come on, remember who you are. My God didn't change. Listen, <laughs> what, what, Pastor Rick, you think you can walk on water? If I need to, I believe the God who let Jesus walk on water is the same God who let me walk on water. <laughs> Listen. Who, wh who is the God who's walking with me right now? He's the God who split the Red Sea. He's the God who spared Noah. He's the God who raised Jesus from the dead, and he's not changed, and he's here right now. He's my God. He is the God of the Old Testament. He is the God of the New Testament, and he is my God right now. 
if I forget that, it's no wonder I'm now teaching my generation or somebody's teaching their generation, God doesn't do that anymore. And then if I tell them what God has done for me, this pastor's deceiving people. <laughs> telling lies. Why? Because God doesn't do that anymore then they have forgotten their God. And I'm not going to forget who my God is. I hope you don't forget who your God is. Because you're never going to see the incredible if you believe you have a God who no longer is incredible. Look at the universe. If they can't figure out who made it, I know who made it. He's my God right now. He's recreating me. He's renewing me. He's restoring me. He's taking me to a future. Is he doing it with you? You know, when people look at, at, at a person or a pastor or somebody and they say, oh, he's different. He's special. Oh no, we all have the same invitation. Don't blame me if you forgot. Come on. That's our God. That's how it should be. We should remember, teach your generation because remembering should give look go to the next one Rem no 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 okay okay i'm sorry we've got to finish this that all the people so they're going to get this instruction that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the lord that it is mighty that you may fear the lord how long forever. fear the lord your god forever so the teaching and remembering of what happened helps you in the present to not forget to know that if he was mighty then, he's mighty now. That's right. And what have we done to a lot of us in our religiosity, uh, in a lot of places in America? We've told them that God doesn't exist anymore. And how can that God not exist? God doesn't need us. God doesn't need these things. He is, he is self-sustaining. How could he not exist? How can that God that did that not be the God that's here now? And if I know the God who did that is the God that's here now, then I don't have to fear. The God that protected them will be the God that protected me. The God that sustained them will be the God that sustained me. That got them through the fire will get me through the fire. The God who got them to their eternity will get me to my eternity. All right, so go to, go to the next one. So remembering gives wisdom to the next generation. Wisdom to the next generation. You see, because if you... Why is it we get all excited when Andrew... My son comes, teaches on like 4th of July and gives us all that history and people go, "Woo! that was great. You know why? Because we don't know our history. And when we don't know our history, it's awesome when somebody tells us that because we get charged up, we get built up. We're going, yeah, that's what I want to hear about my country. Not deception, just plain history. The, re the real things. Was this country perfect? No, it was not perfect. Did it need help? Yes, it needed help. Did we have things that needed to be changed? Yes, we had things that needed to be changed. But do you think God said, oh, they're not perfect. I'm not going to do anything with them. You think that's our God? No, he took imperfect and he was going to be changing it. Do you know what was the last discussion on the Declaration? Of, what was the last argument on the Declaration of Independence? Anybody know? Slavery. That's right. Slavery. We were that close to dealing with slavery at the beginning. But because South Carolina would not come, they finally yielded. And they said, all right, to get the union, we'll, we'll leave it. Because they could not get the votes. Okay? That's what it was. Why was it they were considering that in the first place? Because God was moving on people. God was moving on our founding fathers, as they say. And if we throw that out, throw the baby out with the dirty wash water, we have missed our remembering. What was the last thing they argued about at the Constitution? Slavery. How come we don't, how come we're not taught that? Because if we're taught that, you might feel a little better about our history. You know why we had a civil war over slavery? Because we didn't get it done at the Declaration. We didn't get it done at the Constitutional. That's why we had it. You know why? Because God was doing this nation, nobody else. Let me tell you something else about history. Ben Franklin at the Constitution, you know, as they were working on that, saw all the disruption. It was Ben Franklin, the one who history teachers now in the colleges will tell you did not believe in God at all, who, by the way, invited 
uh, evangelists and people into his house. You know, famous evangelists that would come into, he had them into his house. And it was Ben Franklin who stopped the constitutional work and said, guys, I remember when we used to pray. I remember at the declaration, we used to pray before we got talking. And we haven't been praying lately. Look what's been happening to us. And then he gave the famous quote. He gave them a Bible lesson right there. Mr. Doesn't Believe in God. Gave them a Bible lesson written in history. It says, for if God, if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without the father noticing, then could a nation rise up without his help? And from that moment, they began to pray. And from that moment, we got a constitution. That, by the way, in the courts now, they twist. In the courts now, they do not want to remember what it meant and where it's brought us. They simply want to twist it for their own benefits. We don't have people interpreting the, con the, the constitution anymore. We have people changing the constitution. But let me tell you, God was in our beginnings. And when our kids are taught... Not our beginning. You know what? You can go to college kids today. They don't even know who the vice president is. I'd be embarrassed if you didn't know who the vice president was. I think Mr. Joe Biden is connected to Delaware somehow. But it's embarrassing when college students don't even know who the vice president is. When college students don't even know who our president was two or three presidencies ago. When our college kids know nothing about our founding, nothing about our history, but they do know how to hate the country, then who on earth are their teachers? What are they going when they stand before monuments at Washington? What do they teach them? Do they teach them to remember the things that will inspire them and cause them to come together and cause them to move forward to the future that God's always planned for us? Or are they told to forget their God? When we came and said, we don't need prayer. We do not need the Lord's prayer. Our kids say in the Lord's prayer anymore in school. And they kick prayer out. And most schools, the only prayer they did was our father, which art in heaven. So since they've kicked prayer out of school, our nation no longer knows who created it. Our nation no longer gives honor to our father. And when a nation becomes fatherless, don't be surprised when they hate the nation. You know why we got an immigration problem? Because everybody wants to get here. Yet the home folks don't know how good it is. The home folks don't know what the possibility and the hope of this nation is. And they're being taught to criticize it and to hate it and to come against it. And when the greatest thing my kid can learn in a college setting is learning how to protest, we're in the wrong thing. My kids should learn about what really is the truth of it and have a hope for our future, have a hope to where we are going. It should be a unifying factor knowing, not that we look back and look at people that had issues just like the next generation may look at us and say we have issues. But if we're trying to serve God and if we're walking with God, God will make those changes. It's not for us to look back and judge them as if we were all self-righteous. It's to thank God for what he did. And when my kids come away from our history hating our nation, I know we got a problem. But if we can come to those places and markers and we can give honor where honor is due, it'll keep you. It'll, it'll keep you stayed. It'll keep you firm. And it'll keep you growing. What happens to our nation? The possibility of good is hindered when the history is not taught correctly. You know, they say if you don't teach history correctly, you're doomed to repeat it. And so people that are running our institutions, that are teaching history, that our kids come out and know nothing about history, but they do know how to protest, you know we got issues. Because in remembering, you get a, you, you'll get wisdom to the next generation. If you don't remember, we are in deep trouble. And right now, check them out. Check out the generations. We've got a generation that is in deep trouble because it has no wisdom. The Bible says anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who will give liberally. Right now our nation is starving for wisdom. Starving for wisdom. So let's keep doing it where we are. Let's do it in our homes. Let's make sure they're getting it in their education. If they're not doing it, then you do it. 
Get, work at it. Don't depend on everybody else. Look what they're doing to your kids. People that send off their kids and they come back unbelievers, atheistic, hating their country. I've had parents tell me they sent them off. They were doing great. When they came back, they didn't even like their country anymore. Because the person with that PhD degree, they think must know something. And when they teach history wrong and with the, the wrong emphasis, they come away saying, well, my parents must be stupid. What's going on? Your kids are not being taught to remember. They're looking at a present problem and being talked about in the present, not with memories of the past. The past is being kicked out. That's why we don't even know we were established on Christian principles according to our history teachers. That's why all those men that signed that, most of them were unbelievers according to the history teachers. And they're lying to our kids. And they're lying so that we will not remember who we are. And, we don't, and when we don't remember who we are, that's when we get in trouble. Always when the Israelites got in trouble, they did not remember who they were. They did not remember anymore what their God did. And they did not remember they were set free from bondage. And they would put themselves back into bondage. If you don't know, we're losing liberties. And we are putting ourselves by our own walks, by our own decisions, back into bondage in this country. Then your eyes are closed. If your eyes were open, you would understand there's many things going on that's not providing freedom for us anymore. Think about the godly things that we don't understand anymore. Uh, if you don't think it's happening fast, anybody remember President Obama when he came into office, he thought the family was a man and a woman being married? Said so. Anybody remember that? I mean, we didn't get four years into his administration to where he didn't believe that anymore. And now the Supreme Court has set a precedent that says everywhere else, that's not the family structure anymore. That's how fast it can happen. You don't think persecution will come to the Christian here in the United States? Well, if that happened that fast, before you know it, persecution could be on us. You better remember your God when persecution comes. You better remember your God when persecution comes. Go to the next one. John uh, 16, verse 1, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. I've tell, I'm telling you something right now, so in the future you will not stumble. Look what he says. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming when whoever kills you will think that he offers God's service. Do we not have people terrorizing people now thinking they're doing God's service? It's here, it's upon us right now in a different way, but it's the same thing. And these things they will do because they have not known the Father nor known me. And he's talking about this is going to be Jews persecuting Jews. And he said, here's a Jewish nation who was delivered by God who will not know their own father. And why is that? Because they were not remembering the correct things. And because they do not know the Father and they do not know Jesus, he says, they're going to be persecuting you because they did not know the Father or me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may what? Remember that I told you. Isn't this amazing? That if persecution comes, my strength is God knew about it. Because the God who told me about it is the God who's walking with me through it. The God who told me in this world you will have tribulation is the God who's walking with me through tribulation. The God who told me this is what's going to happen when people rebel against God is the God who will walk with me when it's going on. And if we remember that, then remembering will help us get through trials. Remembering will help us get through persecutions. Put that up. Remembering will help us endure trials, persecutions, things that the enemy is doing to us. Remembering will get you through hard spots, hard places, because in the midst of it, you don't forget who your God is. Many of us, we start going through a hard time and, 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 and we're blaming God instead of remembering who God is. Remember who he is. He's the one who's going to help you get to that place. All right, then the next one, Revelations chapter 2. Revelations chapter 2. Nevertheless, I have this against you. This was a, the Lord writing to the church of Ephesus. And he says this, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. 
Meaning you have forgotten your first love. That's why you left it. You forgot it. You've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Where did they fall from? Their first love. How they were. What they used to be like. Repent and do the first works. Repent. Come back to what you remember there. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from his place. Meaning I'm going to remove your revelation. I'm going to remove your teaching. You're going to become even blinder than you are now if you don't repent. And unless you repent. In other words, it won't change unless you repent. And what revelation you do have is going to be taken away from you. Meaning you will lose the relationship. Boy, it's quiet in this place. Well, how do I stop that, Pastor? Remember the first love? <laughs> you, may, you may say, uh, uh, Pastor, I get tired of hearing about you being 13 years old and giving your life to the Lord. <laughs> you say it so much, I get tired of it. That's fine. I'm still happy about it. <laughs> Keeps me strong. I remember it. The God who wanted to find a 13-year-old is the God who wants to work with this 58-year-old. The God who came into a person that had no direction and gave him direction is the God that's working with me now. I, I, I don't get tired of it. I celebrate in it. You ought to celebrate in yours. You know, if you're tired of your own testimony, I feel sorry for you. The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. That's history of what he did. And the word of our testimony, that's the history of what he's done for us. I get to the end of the journey remembering what he did, and I get to the end of the journey remembering what he did in my life. And that takes me to the end. We need to remember the first things. You know, I'll get a couple, and they'll come in, and they may, you know, I've had couples, they're ready, they're ready to divorce hate each other. They, they, don't, they don't have a, a love going on. And sometimes I've, I've asked, I may say, you know, sometimes you see the animosity right there. They're, they're separated. They're on, maybe on different couches, you know. And I just say, why, why why'd you go for them in the first place? What made you fall in love? Well, they ain't come in and talk about that. They're angry at each other. This thing's going to end. I mean, you know, we hate each other. It drives me nuts. Well, but, I, but I just, what, you know, what was the things that got you going together in the first place? Why did you ever come to the place? And sometimes I've seen them start to say some nice things. Seen him, well, you know, press him. Come on. He starts saying what it was. And amazingly, sometimes I'll see her start blushing. He's saying something good. He's remembering something good. She remembers it too. And the two of them talking about it, and for a moment there, there's a little light in the room instead of darkness. And get them to share, and it's like they don't even want to go there, but when they do it, it starts loosening up the mechanism a little bit. And she might say a few things about them, and maybe the Kleenex has come out, and they're starting to wipe tears. And then I guess honestly say, this is your problem. You guys don't remember why God brought you together in the first place. If you would learn to do this and live that way, the devil couldn't bring you to destroying everything. Come on, do you understand? It's a joy for me to talk with Gail about beginnings. It, it's a joy to remember things along the way. It's a joy to be able to look at pictures. Oh, I hate the, you ought to just sit down there and talk about some of those things. Remember the good things. Remember those things because in remembering that, it strengthens the present. It's in remembering always has an effect on the present. If I, only, if I can only remember what you did last week and I don't remember what God did in the beginning, then we are pulled apart. If I only remember the hurt you did for me and I don't remember any of the good, then all we are is pulled apart. Do you understand how memory, remembering plays an effect on the present? And if you do not use it correctly, if you do not apply it correctly, then you stay weak. People that are caught only in the present do the most destructive things. 
They do the most destructive things. Have you ever had a longtime friend that, that you've been together for a long time? You got all kinds of memories and one thing happens or one thing goes wrong or they think one thing happens and everything is cut off. As if you had no life with them before that. And even when you talk and you're trying to say, hey, what? and they can't go there because they only think about the present. That person is going to have a terrible rough life. Because if you only live in the present, you're never in the right place. You're always having to deal with issues because memory is important to play where you really are and who you really are. And if you only live in the present, you'll destroy a long-term relationship for one thing. You'll destroy a long-term relationship for a lie, for a deception. And why? Because you don't remember. That's why people will get upset at God for something that happens because they don't remember who their God is. You know, Gail and I are already predetermined. If anything goes wrong, here's one person we're not blaming, God. And why is that? Because I know who he is and I want to remember who he is. Therefore, I will not allow myself to get to that place. If anybody's for me, God is. Even if he's correcting me. Even if he's chastening me, as the Bible says. You know, I know I'm his son. You should know you're his son or his daughter. And he will chase him. But he's for me. God's not the problem. I am. We need to remember that. Or else we'll lose what we have. I've had many people lose the relationship because of something in the present who does not remember the past. And once that relationship is lost, how do you restore it? Not very easily. And that's what God's saying here. If you don't remember our beginning, you'll lose your present and your future. So church, let's remember. Amen. Go, go to the next one. So remembering will help you repent. I, I say we are a people of repentance. It, it is walking with God and remembering God that causes my heart to stay repentant. That, that if I veer uh, just a little bit, my heart can quickly come and say, what on earth? And you get back where you are because I remember who God is. Therefore, I remember who I am. And therefore, I get back on track. We become a people that are able to repent. Because we know who we are, we know what God is, and we know who God is in our life. Go to the next one. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, verse 10. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which I swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build. Now, a few weeks ago, we told you this scripture is connected with salvation. It is basically telling you a salvation event. When, when, the, uh, when they come into the promised land, it's what God promises, it's what God gives, it's what they didn't deserve. When I came into my relationship with Christ, I got something I did not earn. I didn't do it. I found blessings that were not my cause. It was because he did it. He did it all for me. I walked into this light that I didn't provide myself. He provided for me. You understand? So this is a picture of people coming into something they did not earn, they did not provide. This is like salvation by grace that I must now live in by faith. Look what it says. When you come in and you have large, beautiful cities which you did not build, because they did, houses full of good things which you did not fill, that's because God prepared it, hewn out wells which you did not dig, so I'm getting water for, for all time because God prepared it for me. Vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant. So I'm eating and being restored all because of what God has done. When you have eaten and are full, when you have fully taken of all these things, then beware. And what's the problem? Lest you forget. Because the only thing that could destroy that relationship is you forget your God. Because the very land, he said at one point, the land that spewed them out, for you to come in, we'll spew you out too. When? When you forget our relationship. So he says, beware, lest you forget the Lord who, why? Why should I remember him? Who brought you out of the land of Egypt, representing sin, and from the house of bondage, representing my slavery. So I should remember the God who set me free and the God who, who delivered me from sin. If I don't, then don't be surprised that I end up back into those same things. If I will not remember, if I start to forget who my God is. But if I remember, he'll sustain me in the very place he brought me. If I don't forget the first love, I can be a long time in the land. 
Do you, you understand? All right, go, go to the next one. So therefore, remembering will help you not forget. It seems kind of silly, but honestly, there are plenty of people who do not practice remembering. That's what I said. People who would give up long-term relationships, long-term friendships because of one thing. And why, what's the problem? Because they've been living on the surface for a long time. And then when you do something wrong, they're out of there because they do not remember what you did or what kind of relationship you guys had. Say amen or oh me. Amen. See, if you've been, well, wait a minute, that's the kind of friend I've been. I got mad at the last people I was with. As a matter of fact, maybe that's why I'm in this fellowship. I got mad at somebody. You know, when people tell me, I try to, I try to make sure, hey, if you got things, get them right. Make sure it's God telling you to come to Crossroad. Don't come to Crossroad because of something else. If somebody's coming here because they got mad at somebody, I tell them they're in the wrong place. If somebody's coming here because they like something, I tell them they're in the wrong place. There's only one reason to be here, because God told you to be here. Because then you're going you're gonna to receive. God's going to do something with you. God will have a purpose. It's part of your walk. You'll See, if God told you to be here, then if anything goes wrong, you can remember that you're here because God sent you. Now, if you came here because of something else and then something goes like you don't like it, well, then you bail because you're not here because God did anything anyway. And you have no memory of it. it you came here because you're mad at somebody else, so you'll leave us too. But it's amazing. If God's directing our life, then it doesn't matter if I'm upset at the preacher, if I don't like this or don't like that. I can't go anywhere because I remember my God. And I only leave when my God tells me to leave. That'll grow you up fast because then you actually have to deal with stuff. You actually have to get stuff fixed. You might have to go forgive somebody. You might have to confess to one another. You might have to be a real family. And yeah, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. Why, why do you think we come together anyway? What's going on when we come together? We're always remembering. This is a, this is a remembering service. Every week, you know, we overcome by what he's done and what he's done for us. When we come together, we are building up, encouraging and edifying one another. Why is that? We're being charged up so the enemy can't get us because we remember who we are. Amen. We walk out of this place knowing who we are. And when we know who we are, it's hard for him to get to us. That's why when your kids leave your house, go to a college that teaches them they're somebody else, you don't recognize the kid you get back. Because he's no longer in a remembering service. But we come in here to remember who we are. You know, my strength is not, you know, I always hear people say, yeah, God's going to do a new thing. Let me tell you, God's done a new thing. His name is Jesus. And now it's remembering what he's done. If you're always looking for a new thing, you'll forget what he's doing right now and you'll forget what he's done. This is a remembrance service. We come here to remember so we stay strong in the Lord. You know, I'm teaching a book that's already been written. <laughs> we're going through things. Listen, we're, why are you looking for something new? God's shown you who he is. That's who he's always been. It might be new to you, but it's not new to God. It's in the remembering that we find out who we are. It's in the teaching of what's already there that we find out who we are. It's not coming up with a new thing. It is doing what he has done. It's remembering who he is. In that we, in our present, are sustained and changed. So remembering will help you not forget. Go to the, the last one. This is 1 Corinthians, which has to do with the uh, communion we're about ready to do. For I received from the Lord that which also... Uh, uh, has been delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me in the same manner he also took the cup after the supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it why in remembrance of me so when you come to the communion, it is all about remembering him. Why? So it sustains you in the present. 
It's all about remembering who he was and who he thought you were and who you are then now. And in remembering, I am strengthened in the present. Here's what God did. He loved me enough that he sent his son. The father saw us in distress and the father in our distress said, don't worry, I got an answer. It's going to be me. You're not going to have to pay the price. I'll pay the price for you. And then from that moment on, I don't want you to ever forget. This is the Passover meal. And Jesus said, now every time you do this Passover meal, remember me. Yes, it was to remember your deliverance out of the, the Egypt and all that, but now it's gone even greater. Now when you come to this Passover lamb, you remember me, the lamb of God. Now, when you partake of this cup, you remember my blood that is shed. Now, when you do that meal and this bread, remember my body that is broken. Now, every time you do this, remember me. This is the place where the Lord said, every time you do this, remember me. Well, there was only one time a year they did it, the Passover. When people, people come and they say, Pastor, how come you, my old church, we did communion every week. How come you don't? Do it every week. And, and I just say because there's no command to do it every week. There is a command that every time Passover shows up, we're to do it in remembrance of him. And, 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 and we've, we've added it to, uh, we do it at Easter, you know, during that time. We do it at Christmas. We do it Memorial Day. We do it a couple other times in the year like, like this. And I've, I don't fault p churches that do it all the time. But here's one of my, my things about that. What happened to the Pharisees? They got religious in their relationship. They made everything become religious and therefore the power of what they were doing was no longer seen by them. They moved into religiosity instead of relationship. I, I, I just don't want to get that we're doing it so much that we don't remember it when we do it. That it doesn't impact us when we do it. In between the gaps, we have enough time that when we hear these things, it becomes even more powerful. I couldn't do this message about communion every week if we were having it every week. But I can do it in the gaps. Now, I'm not saying we're right, and I'm not saying they're wrong. It just helps you understand why I do what we're doing, you know. Just want you to understand that. He came and rescued us because we had a problem. He took our pain so we wouldn't have to. I don't know if Johnny Hopkins is in the room, but... Johnny Hopkins uh, had a granary with his folks. Hopkins Granary. And they would clean uh, seed and, and, and give it back to you. We would let them clean our seed and we'd pick it up so we could plant it the next year. And uh, Johnny had done seed for us. And, and so I took our truck, our farm truck out. And we, uh, back, you know, I backed it up to their room with their uh, escalator. And the escalators would be canvas escalators with... Uh, you know, uh, if you ever saw an escalator, it's a canvas, big, long belt, and Johnny would put the, the clean seed on it, and it would come up into our truck. I'd grab it as it came out, and then I'd pile it up in the, in the truck. On those canvas uh, escalators, they would have a tightener, and that, tight, that bar tightener would tighten that belt so it would stay firm and be able to bring that thing up, and it would keep spinning. Well, Andrew, who was only, I don't know, yay big, uh, wanted to come with me. So, all right, so we get up there, and that'd be neat, you know, a father and a son doing this. And, and so Johnny starts doing the seed. He's bringing them by carts and then putting it on there, and he'd go get another cart and, and, and you know, four or five bags at a time, and, and the escalator's running. Well, one, one time when Johnny sent the bag up and I grabbed it, my son got up to the escal escalator, and he was doing his hand like this. He was doing his hand like that, you know, like as it was turning what he didn't realize is that tightener being right there, that when he went like this and being shorter, he was going like that. Well, it grabbed his hand. And it grabbed his hand. And it took his whole arm in, and that escalator's running. And he just jammed in. And I'm, I got the bag of seed. I'm dropping off, and I hear him start to yell. And I turn around. Well, there he is, jammed in here with the belt running. And he's, he's screaming. And here's the first thing that comes. I instantly know who I am, and I instantly know who he is. I remember I'm his father, and I remember he's my son. Come on. 
And immediately I go up. He's jammed into this thing. This thing's running. And I went up and I put my hands between the belt and that pressure bar. And I'm holding it up with all my strength that I can. And then Johnny, who was going back to get seed, I start yelling out to Johnny. I said, shut it off, shut it off. And I'm standing there letting the belt run on my hands. And the canvas belt is bad enough. And then it's, it's held together by metal bands. So metal bands are coming. And I'm watching another one come and another one come. And I'm just saying, shut it off. While I'm holding it up so his arm, even though it's being sucked in, it's not right on him anymore. And then Johnny shuts it off. And then we back it out so I can get out and he can get out. His shoulder is all cut up, skin torn, you know. And on my hands, the, the top skin on both sides is, is, is ripped. And we, we go to the hospital. And they, they tape him up. And, and I just had regular Band-Aids and whatever they put on. And he probably today is healed. And you look, you probably can't see anything. But when my hands healed, you know, you might look and say, well, that's an age mark. Well, I'm telling you, that's exactly where the skin came off. And when it came together, I suddenly had an age mark. Since I was 30-some years old, I've had that age mark. And, and I've got these right here on this side, which is amazing because it, it, it never stops me remembering my God. My God, my Father came and rescued me. And I healed, but he got scars. And when I come to communion, I remember that's the love of the Father who said, you needed me and I was willing to come and take scars so you could be healed. And I don't care if I, if, you know, remember when Jesus, the resurrected Jesus showed them his scars. That's our God. I don't ever want to forget that because when I remember that, then I know who I am and I know who he is. So as they come today, let's remember who we are. Somebody may be here and you may say, I don't know God like that. I don't know him as Lord. I've never prayed a prayer of giving my heart to Jesus. Well, you need to do it. If God's drawing you, you need to do it. If your heart's been opened up to that, then you need to do it. Or else you're just drinking grape juice and a cracker. It's not going to mean a thing to you. But if you're here today and you've never given your heart to the Lord, then brother, sister, if God's drawing, do it today. Surrender today. Give your heart to him today. I'll lead you in that prayer. I guarantee you, your brothers and sisters that are here that understand are going to be glad for you. They'll celebrate with you. But you have to be bold in front of people and be able to confess and say, Pastor, it's me. I need this prayer before this comes. I want this to have meaning to me. If that's you, brother, sister, raise that hand. We'll say this prayer with you. Anybody need that prayer today? All right, I don't see any hands. I'm going to trust and believe that you've done that. Come on up, guys. So here's what I want you to do as they're passing it out. Consider where you are. Let's look at the whole list. Remembering helps you to understand. It gives you understanding. Remembering gives wisdom to the next generation. Remember helps you endure trials. Remembering will help you repent. Remembering will help you not forget. Remembering will cause you to know and to be thankful for the full measure of all our Lord did for us. His name is Jesus. So remember as it comes, repent if you have to, give thanks, prepare your heart. Thank, be thankful that God's with you in this trial. Be thankful that God's with you in this hard time. If somebody's persecuting you at home or at work or where you are, be thankful that God's with you. As you receive this today, remember, be thankful. Let him change your present to where it should be. All right, amen. Now receive it. Remembering gives understanding. Remembering gives wisdom to the next generation. Remembering will help you endure trials. Remembering will help you repent. Remembering will help you not forget. Remembering will cause us to know and be thankful for the full measure of all our Lord did for us. So as we take the matzah cracker 
with its piercings, with its brokenness. We're going to remember the broken body right now. Heavenly Father, thank you that you gave your son. And thank you that he was willing to pay a price. The, the word says he did not, nobody took his life, he laid it down willingly. He took wounds for us. He took scars for us. He took thorns for us. He bore pain for us. The enemy did all it could to him, but he did it to save us. So we thank you, Lord. We celebrate in the broken body. By his stripes, we are healed. And we receive that today with a grateful heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Receive together the broken body. And the cup, the most precious gift, his very life. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Without the giving of a life, then there's no saving of our life. But he gave it, and he gave it willingly. He did all that his father commanded and said, Lord, into your hands, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. He laid it all down for us. This represents that blood. Let's be grateful for it. Heavenly Father, thank you for this precious blood. We are to consider it precious. We are not to trample it under our feet. In receiving it, we should be grateful and repent of anything that separates us. Thank you for hearing our repentance. Thank you for bringing us to the very place that we need to be at this very moment as we remember the very life, the most precious gift of heaven that was given for us, that we would be spared and have an opportunity for all eternity with you. We receive it, Father, with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen and receive. And Lord, I pray your blessing on this congregation. Lord, that we truly would continue to grow in knowing who you are. That we would never forget who you are and the things that you have done for us. And Lord, that you would continue to grow us in the things of God. And as we come here and speak and learn of the things that, that you have done and who you are that will never change. May you continually be conforming us to be the man and the woman you've desired us to be. And may we give you all the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name that everybody said.